Hello, uh, and welcome to the Cambridge PhD podcast. Uh, with me today, we have Simon Abernethy, and who's going to be speaking about his PhD thesis in the Faculty of History on Class and Commuting in Greater London from 1860 to 1940. So, Simon, if you'd like to give us a bit of an introduction. Um, yeah, sure. Well, basically, I look at the relationship between public transport and how that's impacted the growth of Greater London in terms of class. So why working class people wind up in the northeast of London and why they don't wind up in, say, Richmond or the more salubrious areas of London. Um, it stems from the fact that I'm from the northeast of London and I travel, I used to commute fairly regularly through the suburbs that back in sort of Victorian Edwardian era were being created by very cheap transit. Um, and they've retained a lot of that character. Um, so as a kid, I was always fascinated as to why this was the case. Um, plus the archive was just down the road from me. <laughs> so there was, I, I saved a lot of effort there um, by picking this subject. Um, and so basically I look between around 1860 and 1940 about just how public transport shaped London, um, which I think it's done to a, a tremendous extent and a slightly underrated extent. Um, and it's doubly good for me because a lot of the sort of historians who looked at this did so in the sort of 50s, 60s and 70s and often the sort of historiography has been left there. Mm -hmm. So it's quite nice to sort of come back to it having given it you know, a good 30 years and just be able to sort of knock it down, mm -hmm. um, which is always pleasant for a historian. Um, now we have computers and things that just they didn't have. Mm -hmm. So we have you know, access to a great deal more information. Um, and that's basically it. Mm -hmm. So tell us, I mean, what kind of arguments are being made in that earlier historiography that you're trying to knock down with your own research? Well, essentially, and it's something that's often repeated, um, and it's, it's a phrase that most historians know, is this notion of a slums and suburbs sort of idea of the city. So in the centre of the city you have the working class, sort of poor slum dwellers, um, and before the First World War you get this middle class movement away from the centre, um, and that leaves the working classes behind. And so often historians will say, well, you know, the, the suburbs are very middle class space, a very middle class social space, um, which is then reinforced in the 20s and 30s. Um, and that, to me, just isn't very accurate, because before the, the First World War, we have this huge working class migration um, that's not, you know, really sponsored by the state. There's no real council housing. It's all done by private means and by private enterprise. Um, and it's actually quite a nice feeling because you have these people who are, you know, history always deems to have been trapped mm -hmm. and impotent in their situation, suddenly coming out, um, getting their little house and their little garden mm -hmm. and being very pleased about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not much, but to many of them, it's the best thing that's ever happened to them. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at the challenges they face, because mm -hmm. life in the suburbs isn't an unmitigated blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, they do have very low wages. They do spend a lot of money on their commuting. As you know, people complain about today, they have to deal with transport companies that are not necessarily inclined to their best interests. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of looking at that relationship between these working class people moving out, the middle class people they displace, and the railway companies, especially the railway companies, um, that see this quite often as a threat mm -hmm. to their established position. So I'm quite keen to go on to you know, the realities of commuting in this period and how they change. But before we do, could you sketch for us a little bit the geography of this? So where do you see, um, where do people start out and where do they end up and how does, how does class, class shift with, uh, with, with regard to particular areas of the city across your period? So what we have from the, the 1860s is essentially the area surrounding the county of London, basically Greater London, mm -hmm. is growing at a huge rate. Um, and what we also see is incredible overcrowding in the centre, mm -hmm. um, which in the 1880s is described as the housing crisis, mm -hmm. um, which is, <laughs> which is a very us, familiar yeah. term. It's that the housing crisis has never left. Um, and so what you, you get is, is attempts to move these people out. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you have lots of people coming in from the home counties to live in London because you, know, you have a booming metropolis. And what we find is that areas which have the cheapest transport so, and you know, often we're talking about you know, 10 times cheaper for the same distance. Um, they will attract a lot more working class people. And what we wind up with is a massive northeastern skew. Mm -hmm. So for anyone familiar with London, we're talking about places like Edmonton, Walthamstow, out towards Enfield, mm -hmm. um, and then out towards the east. So East Ham, West Ham, Barkingway, 
Um, and the role that the, the railways play is fundamental because this is the only means of getting um, from this distance into the centre of London in good time. Mm -hmm. um, you have buses, you have trams, but they're mainly for you know short, relatively short journeys. Mm -hmm. So we talk about four miles. And when you're 11 miles out, you are dependent on the train. Um, so people follow the railway lines, as you'd expect them to. Um, and areas which don't get this provision, um, so like Leighton, Ilford, um, have a very, very middle class you know, um, ethos and emphasis, mm -hmm. um, especially at like a local municipal level, because obviously the councils are middle class mm -hmm. and they're not particularly happy that their neighbours are very working class. So they do, you know, they do their best to fend them off. Mm -hmm. So what we see is not really a, a city segregated for with, a, with a slum ridden centre and a, a middle class suburbia, but rather suburbs which grow up with a particular class identity, mm -hmm. which may be stuck bang next to each other. And that's where we see the sort of segregation occur. Okay. But uh, in terms of the working class, it's definitely the northeast that's where we see that. That's absolutely fascinating. I think what I'd love to hear a bit more about is how this, what's the experience like of this kind of commuting? Because presumably in 1860, 1880, 1900, the experience of getting the train to work is quite different to what it is today. I think we'll describe it as rough. Okay. Um, there's a brilliant account given by a Labour MP um, just after the First World War. And he was travelling by what we call a workman's train. So the, for a little bit of background, the way it works is very early in the morning you have a workman's train, it's very, very cheap. Um, then this is followed by third class and then you sort of roll through the day. Um, the workman's trains were the cheapest and they tended to be the most overcrowded. Um, the railway companies didn't supply very good carriages or stock because the idea was these people probably don't pay mm. any kind of profit on their journey. So we'll give them the worst things we have imaginable. Mm. Um, and he describes a scene which is dozens of people crammed into a compartment that's only really meant to take, you know, maybe six people. And you've got, you've got builders, painters, people covered, absolutely plastered in you know, building materials. You have people travelling back from Billingsgate and Smithfield, which are the fish market and the meat market, and they're equally covered in, you know, fish and meat. Not the most pleasant. No, it's horrendous. And he goes, and, you know, he's very earnest. He, he goes, you know, members of the railway companies who are in this house may laugh when I say this, but I had to get off that train and vomit at the station. That was how bad it was. Mm. Um, so it's not, it's, it's pretty, pretty grim. And, when are these, and these trains are running significantly earlier um, than other commuter trains? Or are they running at the same time? It depends on the railway company. Mm -hmm. um, the Great Eastern, which takes the most work from passengers, and the railway company that serves um, Edmonton, Walthamstow, Leighton, those areas, running out of Liverpool Street, mm -hmm. um, they run their workman's trains up until about 6.20 in the morning, um, mm -hmm. and then they stop. And then the way the Great Eastern does it, is the following trains are slightly more expensive. So they appeal to a slightly better class of worker. And then the next set of trains are slightly more expensive still. So they appeal to your clerk or your white collar worker. Mm -hmm. And then again, so through the morning, what you get is what they themselves describe as a class-based approach to transport. Mm -hmm. We separate our classes, we put them in specific trains at specific times at specific prices, and then we can run this flow of people through without them mixing with each other because they're terrified that if you put these workmen with the sort of middle class clerks, what happens is the middle class clerks go, we don't, we don't have to put up with this, we'll just move. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people do. Um, that's why Edmonton sort of goes from a very nice middle class area, a middle class sort of village town mm -hmm. in the 1850s to the, one of the most infamous of the working class suburbs by 1890. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always cited as an example of the working class suburb. So could you tell us a little bit more about how the railways work in general in this period, whether they're nationalised, whether they're privatised, who's running what? So what we have are private companies which own all aspects of the railway infrastructure. So whereas today, you know, private companies own the trains, but then you have like network rail and they look after the track and then someone else will look after the station and all of this. Um, the railway companies own everything and there's multiple railway companies. So in London, depends on the time period, you've got about a dozen private railway companies, mainline railway companies, um, not including, say, the Tube Railways, which, again, are all privately owned. They run off privately raised capital. They pay profits to shareholders. Mm -hmm. They pay on their dividends. Um, they're not subsidised by government in any way, shape, or form, as they are today, because back then the railways make a profit, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which is you know unusual for us now. Yes, but back then they do make a profit. 
but it's uh, a period of time where these dividends are being squeezed. Mm -hmm. And when you have a private railway company, obviously the concern is to maintain that dividend, um, to maintain your, you know, your popularity with your shareholders. Um, and the idea of casting lots and lots of working class people who don't pay an awful lot of money to your railway line fills the railway companies with dread. Mm -hmm. And the other key aspect is the railway companies pay what are called the rates. It's like a local tax. Mm -hmm. Poorer districts have a higher rate burden. The railway company has to pay more tax. So it's a double-edged sword. So not only are you carrying more working class people who pay less, you're encouraging them to live in a district which then winds up with a higher tax burden mm -hmm. because it needs more sort of social help. Um, and this again starts squeezing your dividends more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Well, you told us a little bit earlier on about a uh, about a Labour MP uh, speaking in the House about the awful conditions on workmen's trains. How does in this you know in this wholly privatised rail system, um, why does this become a national political issue, or is it something that's cared about at higher levels? Well, before the war, it's before the First World War, it's um, a local government issue. So what we have is in eighteen eighty nine the formation of the London County Council, which essentially is the first. London-wide um, municipal authority. I say London-wide, it, it only covers the county of London, mm -hmm. which to a Londoner today is the very, very middle of the city. Yes. Um, and the LCC are very concerned with the housing crisis, mm -hmm. and they're very concerned with moving these you know, people in slums, moving them out. Um, and they do, they're canny people, they do a calculation and they work out it's cheaper to force the railway companies to provide cheap trains than it is for them to demolish houses and then rebuild houses in the centre because the value of land in the centre of London is far too expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so by doing this, they can save themselves a bit of cash and they can also appeal to a, a working class electorate because the local electorate is much more broad than the national electorate. Mm -hmm. Then what we see after the First World War is that the franchise is extended and suddenly you get these Labour MPs in the House of, House of Commons, in Parliament, who then bring up this issue again. Whereas before the war you don't really see that. You have a sort of more, the Liberal Party occasionally has the odd philanthropist who will mention to Parliament that this is, this is not odd, that then will do absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but after the war, it becomes much more charged and much more national because you have a sort of early Labour breakthrough. And you have people who were travelling on these trains are suddenly in the House of Parliament looking at the director of the railway company opposite. And you get these fantastic exchanges between people like Frank Broad, who was the Labour MP complaining about the conditions, and there's, there's one chap who's the director of the Great Northern Railway who goes, no, the, the, the people were criminals and they were cutting all the straps off the train, uh, the leather straps and stealing them and we, we don't know why and this is outrageous. And you have the, the Labour MP from Walthamstow going, well, your services were so rubbish um, that we had to walk lots and people were nicking the leather straps to replace the soles of their shoes. That's why it was happening. Wow. Um, and that's the first time you get that that sort of exchange in Parliament. Because before the war, the railway companies had it all their own way. It presumably comes as a huge shock then on the floor. To be yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, and the other major shift is that in 1921, um, you get the beginning of the grouping, the railway grouping. So all these multiple railway companies, um, which during the war have been run down, get turned into four railway companies, mm -hmm. what we call the big four, very ominous. Um, and of course, the number of railway directors suddenly decreases because the companies don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. You only have four companies. Um, so they lose a lot of their power in the interwar period. Mm -hmm. And equally, you get this rise of labour who are very, very interested in sort of cheap transit for the working classes, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. So this just naturally becomes more of an issue and something that more people are concerned with. Yeah, okay. essentially. So, Simon, you mentioned a little bit about as um, working class people are moving, uh, moving out northeast, that you see for the first time people becoming you know, a lot more house proud, having their own homes and gardens and things like this. Um, I wonder if there's any kind of particular stories or any particular individuals you want to tell us about, just to give a kind of human face to that. Yeah, I mean, in the sort of court documents when they're interviewing people, um, often they interview people about their background. Um, and there's, there's one chap, for example, who seems to have inherited some money. Um, and built his own house. Um, and the council sees this as a, a way of undermining the witness, because the witness is purportedly a workman, um, you know, someone who earns very low wages, and the man's built his own house. Mm -hmm. So the council goes on, so you're now a member of the homeowning classes. You are surely not amongst these mere mortals. You are elevated on high. Um, and the chap sort of just laughs it off very, very politely, um, which is a, it's a, it's a, nice, a nice sort of part of it. 
but often it sort of emphasizes the struggle that mm. these people have. There's one chap who lives out in the suburbs, um, but maintains a sort of engineering warehouse, where shop, um, in Soho. And he's spending money on his rent, he's spending money on his commuting, he's spending money on this workshop. Um, and it becomes obvious that the sums that he's presenting don't quite add up. Mm. And the council goes, well, how do you... And the chap, it's very hard to tell, because obviously you lose the emphasis on the wording in a text document. Mm -hmm. But the chap just seems to sort of snap and goes, well, now you're getting to the question, aren't you? Um, what little I have, I am spending, and I'm going to run out soon. I will lose that. And it sort of highlights just that this isn't necessarily a... It's not necessarily about having a house and garden. It's just about trying to support yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly there are lots of, of people who are very, very happy um, and who describe it as, you know, I came out here for my children and my own health mm -hmm. um, and I like it. I like having my little plot and I like having my kids mm -hmm. around and then my kids will eventually go to work on the train as well because mm -hmm. it's often about this sort of family wage. Um, I work, my wife works and my kids will work when they're able um, and that's how we'll support this whole, this whole you know, project out here in the suburbs. And undoubtedly some people fail and some people have to move back, but on the whole, I think you get a sort of nice suburban working class community uh, with the occasional working class homeowner. Um, mm -hmm. Very, very proud yeah. of his little, little patch, which I think is great. Um, I want to actually just to draw back for a second and to ask you, um, because you, your material moves, it seems, from the House of Commons right down to the realities uh, on the railways themselves. What kind of sources are you working with um, and what kind of interests and difficulties do they throw up? A delightfully varied range of sources. <laughs> um, the thing about, uh, the reason I love what I do is that I look, often look through railway um, accounts and tramway accounts, and these are the kind of accounts that historians tend not to look at. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in social history, why would you go through, you know, the statements of the railway companies? Um, but these statements throw up some really, really good stuff. So internal memos between company officials, why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I also look at a lot of parliamentary papers, um, which will essentially interview um, people mm -hmm. um, and before the First World War you have a lot more working class people interviewed um, so like there's various royal commissions which will pluck you know Jim Smith painter from Lambeth mm. and just go Jim Smith what do you think and Smith will then explain what he thinks mm. and how it's all working um, there are also some very good court documents which again have a sort of delightful delightful engagement between these sort of very working class people very proud working class people and these sort of high-flying legal councils, which try and tie them up, as you can mm. imagine, sort of legalese. Um, and what you get, surprisingly, is not a... You'd expect a sort of deference to authority, and what you get is a very sort of bolshy, I would say, a bolshy attitude. So you have council going, well, why do you live in this place? If the transport facilities aren't good, why don't you go over here? And you've got, you've got the man going, well, I don't want to. I like it here. <laughs> it's nice. And that's, that's brilliant. Um, so those are the sort of sources I look at. It's, it's a really broad range. Mm, of course. That's really fascinating. As well. I think something else uh, I wanted to get at was that, obviously, this kind of conflict um, between, you know, within a segregated train system and within a rigid class system as well, um, does this boil over into uh, more violent conflict as well? There's one major flashpoint, which mm. happens in 1899. And once again, it involves Edmonton, which is probably why Edmonton becomes so infamous. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably this incident that really does it. And the Great Eastern Railway. Um, so what we have is a, is a railway company that is becoming increasingly tired and fed up of complaints about overcrowding, etc. Um, it's not making a huge amount of money and it knows that this is mainly because of this, this workman's traffic. So what they do, foolishly what they do, is they try and change the ticketing system, which sounds innocuous enough. So what they do is they go, well, instead of buying a ticket on the day, you have to buy a ticket the previous Saturday and you'll buy it for a week. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. Saturday is the day when people are at work, workmen are at work, because you work a six-day week. So no one's around to buy the tickets. Mm -hmm. They also don't tell anyone that's what they've done. So one day in February, it's probably very cold, a load of workmen turn up to take their normal train. These people are often sort of regular or casual workers. They can't afford to miss a day's work. And the man at the ticket office says, no, you can't cut on the train because you didn't buy a ticket. This goes down badly, as you can imagine, with well, the big crowd of workmen um, who hijacked the train. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how they managed this, but the, the railway officials are not pleased. Um, and they just ride the train up to Liverpool Street. And the following day, there's a couple of policemen at Edmonton Station. 
workmen just brush them aside, the same thing happens again. Um, and it gets to the point where, on, on the, the, ma the biggest day of, of violence, you have something like 2,000 passengers in Liverpool Street Station, um, and the Metropolitan Police are called in. But unfortunately, they deploy six constables to deal with the menace, which turns out to be something of an underestimate mm. of the number of police required to deal with 2,000 very angry, very large people. Um, and the result is absolute carnage. Um, the workmen basically go on the rampage. They get into the taxi rack, they flip over a wagon, um, and then mount a brief, a brief stand, it's described as. The policemen desperately sent for reinforcements. There's now 100 additional policemen on the way. Uh, the railway company has its own police force. It's very, very dubious, sort of irregular police force, which is trying its best to deal with the problem. Um, but they're completely taken by surprise that this would happen. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing you know, someone hurls the contents of their lunchbox at a policeman, um, and a sandwich takes his helmet off. And within a couple of minutes, there's a bombardment of sandwiches um, hurled at the police. And about, I think, four, people, four or five people are arrested, mm -hmm. um, including one, one chap who was arrested on the charge of assaulting a policeman with a sandwich. <laughs> um, and and the, ma the magistrate just calls you, he's like, you do realise what you did was wrong, yes? And he's, the poor kid's like 17, he says, yeah. And the magistrate's like, okay, just, just go, go on. <laughs> Um, but a couple of guys get hard labour um, mm. for, for their involvement mm -hmm. um, and there's stuff like you know, incendiary speeches, um, the local paper publishes a little ditty to the sort of the tune of the, the charge of the light brigade, um, which is like into the railway yard, Edmonton thundered, um, which is quite good fun. Um, and you see a lot of sympathy from Edmonton Council as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a sort of random event from a few people who are, you know, antagonised. The council backs these people mm -hmm. and then goes around paying people's legal costs. Oh. Uh, and, you know, the people who are arrested are described as martyrs um, to the cause. And you begin to realise just how important this is to people. Mm -hmm. um, after this incident, the Great Eastern Railway really clamped down on it. Um, but there's this, there's, there remains a irreverence on the part of the local population because um, the ticketing system stays and obviously workmen can't purchase the tickets on Saturdays. Um, and there's a really nice report in the paper where the wives and the children will go down to the station en masse to buy the tickets for the train. Um, and it's described as every time the head of an official is seen, there is a large, a large quantity of booing and hooting and songs of a sarcastic nature are sung. Um, and it's just a sort of wonderful community image. That's really fascinating. I suppose the, the side of it that interests me then at the end um, is, is to talk about the role that women and children play here as well. I suppose, is there a question to be asked here about where you have class segregation? Is there an element of gender segregation in transport use, or is it the case that there are far fewer women using these than there are workmen? Um, well, there's far fewer women than there are men. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking, I think, I, I vaguely remember the calculations, but we're talking about 5% of the mm -hmm. total by workmen's trains, which is what we have sort of vague statistics for. Um, but there are references, so the manager of what, what we now call the Central Line says in, I think, 1906, all my workmen passengers are predominantly work women um, travelling up to like Liverpool Street. Because there's a lot of sort of factory work um, in Liverpool Street. Um, a lot depends on the area. Um, Edmonton's very good. It has one of the highest sort of rates of, of women, women travelling by these trains. Um, and what you also get is a tendency of women to travel later. Mm -hmm. So I think on the last workman's train out of Edmonton, you're talking about 12% of the passengers are women. Um, do they segregate them? No. But what the railway company does do in Edmonton is it re reserves 200 tickets for use only by women. Mm. And they see, a, they see a sort of market in this. And you know, they interview the, the, the chap that's running the railway company. He says, all the tickets are taken. But we don't, we don't take steps that actively segregate you know, the women and children from the men. Mm -hmm. Because often what happens is you have whole families going up in the train. Um, and this is really important for the historiography because back in the 50s and 60s the argument was that working class people couldn't leave the centre because wives and children had to work and the only place they could get work was in the centre of London doing things like domestic cleaning and all of this and that's why they can't move to the suburbs. But what we have are areas where the transport is so cheap that even when you're, you know, and we've got sort of like girls aged nine and ten, mm -hmm. even when you're only earning a, basically a pittance, mm -hmm. um, it still makes economic sense to travel in and out. And there's a, there's a good interview with a husband who has eight children, I think, and he's, he's got very, very low earnings. Um, and he says, well, none, none of my children travel by the train. They're not old enough. 
but I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for the moment that can happen because mm -hmm. a lot of these people depend on what we call a family wage. Yes. Um, and there's also a sort of humorous aspect to it for us. Um, the Great Eastern Railway find that a lot of the women will bring a little stove with them on the train and they find that their waiting rooms end up covered in kippers <laughs> because the wives are cooking breakfast in the waiting room because they get, they get there so early. Mm. They're waiting there for a couple of hours. Um, and the waiting room's just covered in fish. So the, the, the railway company are like, no, we're not, we're not allowing you to stay here anymore. Um, and then of course it's, well, what do you do with these, these women and children? So the church around the corner steps in mm. and they're like, well, we'll welcome these people in um, for some, some teachings and some sermons and we shall have them for a couple of hours every day. And it's a sort of curate's dream. Mm. Um, do and they allow any cooking of kippers? No, I uh, believe the cooking of kippers is, is not a... They've gone off the whole feeding people with fish model. Indeed, yeah. yeah. It's, quite, it's quite religious, actually, yeah. isn't it? There's a delightful yeah. religious aspect <laughs> to it. Um, and in fact, actually, the, the workmen's trains themselves have what's, what's called the... I believe it's called the Edmonton and Enfield Workmen's Train Mission, where one carriage is dedicated to some... basically a couple of some very nice little old ladies who run sort of a, like a hymn service on the train every morning for these children and these women. Um, and it's described as a place where the, the more foul nature of language that is more accustomed to the rest of the train is not heard. Um, but we also have, there's a letter in, in, I think, the Tottenham Herald from a man who travels on this train who complains about the presence of religious fanatics. He says, every morning I have to put up with this hymn singing every single morning. It's horrendous. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite nice. So you do get this aspect of we have to save these people from themselves, mm -hmm. in a sense. But equally, they're there to go to work. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to get stuck in the station for a couple of hours. You know, they get cheap transport. That's their problem. Mm. It's amazing that these sources give you such an insight into the whole multi-sensory world of it. I mean, between rude language and people singing hymns to the smell of capers and these kind of blood-slicked butcher's clothes. I mean, it just it seems like an amazing way into the period. Um, what I wanted to ask as well was just to get a sense of, obviously this isn't uh, what we experience today. I mean, I was on the tube this morning and it was, I mean, it was dodgy. Uh, but it seems slightly more manageable than that, and nobody sang any hymns, uh, mm. which is a real pity, I think. Um, but what I suppose I want to get at is what changes across your period as you approach the Second World War, and maybe even afterwards, what brings this system or these systems closer to what we recognise today? It's definitely the interwar period mm. that plays a major role. Um, what we see is... During the First World War, uh, a huge increase in the earnings of manual workers relative to their, their white collar counterparts. And this permits an attack on the sort of cheap train system. Um, and what we also have is because people are earning more, these manual workers are earning more, they don't have to travel early in the morning anymore. They have the disposable income to afford to travel later in the day. So we see this sort of merging. Um, and it's the period where we really get severe rush hours. So I think in, 19, in, in the early 1920s, London Underground was carrying as many people as they are today on a system that's not even you know, about half the size. Mm. Because you know, people can't drive. There's no sort of personal transport. The trams and the buses are taking a lot of traffic, but the Underground Railways are handling a huge quantity of traffic. Um, and it just sort of pushes everyone together. This sort of old-fashioned Great Eastern Railway-style attempt at segregating everyone by time doesn't fit in with uh, a model that highlights efficiency. The underground are after getting people through the system as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. They retain a workman's fare, but basically it's up until 7.30, your ticket's half the price. So what you get are sort of what we call twin peaks. Um, so up until 7.30, you get lots and lots of people traveling, and then it drops off. And then up until sort of 8.39, again, you get another second peak mm -hmm. um, as people better off travel. But ultimately, you lose all this sort of nuance, um, nuance, that classic historian's word, um, <laughs> from the system. And there was a document I came across a couple of weeks ago, which summed it up brilliantly. It was from the railway company that succeeded the Great Eastern Railway. Um, and they still had aspects of the, the Great Eastern's sort of class segregation program in place. So it was, it, was, it was bizarre. You couldn't buy a third class season ticket on parts of the system. Um, whereas everywhere else you can. So you either get a workman's ticket or a second class ticket. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a big gap because pretty much everyone else travels on a third class ticket. Um, and it's the LNER, the London North Eastern Railway. And they're wondering why that's the case. And there's just a sentence which goes, we don't, we don't know why this has happened, 
but it seems to be from some attempt to segregate manual workers from not their non-manual counterparts. And this is in the late 30s, mm -hmm. and it's just, this isn't relevant anymore. We don't need this. Mm -hmm. This is just too problematic to operate. So they abolish it. It's the sort of the last facet of this class-based approach to transport mm -hmm. that just disappears. Um, and then after the Second World War, the workman's ferry also disappears um, because you get full-scale nationalisation of the railways. Mm -hmm. It's austerity. It's time to, to sort of lose these aspects. Um, and that basically kills my PhD, essentially, <laughs> because I can't study it anymore. Because I lose this graduation of fares and tickets, mm -hmm. which is vital to studying the relationship. Mm -hmm. And once that goes, it's very difficult to pull it apart. Mm -hmm. um, and we see the rise and rise of carriages full of people studiously avoiding each other's gazes. And, indeed, yeah. And then the headphones, which change yeah. everything once again. Um, I suppose the last thing I'd like to ask you is, uh, with regard to, you've got some time left uh, in the PhD, some more research to come. Mm -hmm. um, what, in an ideal world, what do you want to find? What are you looking for? What's going to put the icing on the cake for you? I'd like to find more personal um, aspects mm -hmm. to, the, to the, whole, the whole business. Um, the best thing about looking at the period before World War One is you have these sort of personal interviews with people. Um, and you lose that in the 20s and 30s because it becomes a more technocratic game. Mm -hmm. So rather than inviting the passengers who travel, you invite the chap that runs the system and he'll explain everything. Mm -hmm. um, and what you get are people like Frank Pick, who anyone who's familiar with the underground will know um, very well because he's essentially the chap that, that runs the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and he's the guy that designed the underground logo, for example. Mm -hmm. So he's, you know, he's, he's, he's massive in this, this period. Um, and actually he annoys every Royal Commission he ever turns up to because he's a massive statistician. He loves his statistics. And the beginning of lots of these commissions will go, Mr. Pick, you once again have turned up with a huge quantity of evidence which we <laughs> cannot possibly put into the publication. Um, what would you like to do? And then Pick will just start reaming off lots and lots of technocratic information which is good in a sense because it's, it's nice to have those statistics, but it loses the, the passenger experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that becomes a lot more difficult to find. Mm -hmm. So I'd love a lot more of that. That would be perfect. Excellent. Well, the very best of luck with it, and I hope it happens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this Cambridge PhD cast, presented by me, John Gallagher, and produced by Richard Blakemore and Ruth Rushworth, and produced in association with Crash. If you'd like to hear more from us over our fantastic collection of PhD casters, please visit the Crash website at crash, that's with two S's, dot C-A-M dot A-C dot U-K. Thank you for listening.